next hour. We're going to hear from Ted DeLay, who's going to talk about a new book called God is Unconscious, Psychoanalysis, and Theology, published by Woods and Stock. And I'm not going to do the introduction. I'm going to turn it over to one of our esteemed uh, graduate students, who's also a good friend of Ted's, who probably knows every intimate detail of his life. You know, <laughs> Share because we're doing an analysis mm -hmm. sort of here today, so anything goes. I'll leave you a few minutes to talk at the end. No, yeah, try, try, try to introduce you. Tell them what the book is just about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, like uh, Carl said, uh, a lot of it already. Actually, the book is "Guys Unconscious: Psychoanalysis and Theology," written by Tad Delay. Um, I've known Tad for I don't know two or three years now. Yeah. yeah so Tad uh, did his bachelor's degree um, in psychology, I believe, right? At at the University of Central Arkansas. I also did my undergraduate work there, and we were there at the same time, but had no idea who the other was. We never met each other. We met serendipitously through um, a mutual friend, a professor uh, of mine that he was getting in touch with uh, in religious studies. We actually met at a Zizek reading group in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. But we've gone to some conferences together um, and hung out, whatever, we're both in Arkansas uh, together. So he went on to do his master's degree, got an MA at Fuller Theological Seminary. After graduating from there, went on to Claremont Graduate University. He's doing, I think it's a PhD in religion, right? Mm -hmm. But also picking up an MA in philosophy along the way to kind of add the old CV. Um, mm -hmm. It's also got a book to do that with now. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll let you tell them about all your pathologies and, and neuroses okay. instead. Oh. It'll probably be better that way. But, okay. Yeah, without further ado. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I read this book. Ed. It's been out for just about a month, and this is the first time that I've been my work, so I'm very excited to be here, and thanks to Carl, but, um, I, the, I mean, the book is God is Unconscious, Psychoanalysis and Theology, and part of what I'm trying to do is, my experience has been that uh, anytime you're in a, in a religious studies or theology department or philosophy department that engages critical theory, you end up having to learn a little bit or two, a little bit about the psychoanalysis, and what a lot of people do is they, they start with Seminar 11, or a couple, a little bit of Freud, uh, and then they pick up some Zizek and are never quite sure how much Lacan they're actually getting. And then from there, like it's kind of a it's kind of a question of where to go from there. So what I did was I just thing that Lacan's had published in English, tried to footnote it as copiously as possible and provide sort of a guide to kind of talk about the uh, religious themes. One thing I'm doing in the book is not trying to privilege psychoanalysis or theology whether. Um, I think it's probably immediately clear why religion can use psychoanalysis, or why religion needs to be psychoanalyzed. Um, on the other hand, I think it's every bit as much true that psychoanalysis needs religion. Um, if for no other reason than that Lacan himself claimed that you actually can't understand the psychoanalytic revolution without understanding the Protestant Reformation. Um, he said to not understand what, what Martin Luther is doing um, is to fundamentally misunderstand. We covered a little bit of why that is last night. We, I mean, we talked about uh, how, you know, going on what St. Paul says, uh, Luther's not just making the claim that law defines sin, but that law actively creates sin. And there's this moment, this epiphany of grace that he has um, when he's reading through the epistles of Romans, um, which is not the big other does not exist. That is when the therapy concludes, when you realize you no longer need this absolution to begin with. Uh, Luther also has a few things that Lacan kind of never gets to um, that could also pass as Lacanian. Luther kind of says, um, well, he has one comment that I like where he says, uh, we are never lords of our actions, but servants, sort of the same, where the uh, id was, the was, the ego will be. Uh, you know, if, uh, I think it's in Beyond the Pleasure, no, it's in the, the Ego and the Id, where uh, Freud compares the ego a writer trying to control a much stronger horse. The horse will take you where it wants to go, and your ego will find the justification for, for why you're there. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to privilege one over the other, but try to let them read each other and produce mm -hmm. hopefully some new insight through that. Um, to begin, to start with the beginning. Um, in the gospel, according to John, was the word, and the word was with the other and the word was the other the word was with the other in the beginning and the word proceeded forth to make humankind out of machine and we live in the aftermath 
Um, Lacan always liked to say that it is when the word got incarnated that things really started going badly. Uh, the underside of a signifier's power to tell us who we are uh, is has this us, um, latent power to construct these unforgivable narratives about ourselves. And so in our 20s or 30s, we start to go to therapy to sort of sort through how we got to the where we are and why we are the way that we are. Um, and we imagine that we go to therapy for a number of reasons, but really they all come down to two. Uh, Lacan says it. everything that we do in psychoanalysis comes down to the Oedipus complex of sort of aspects of alienation and separation. On the one hand, we start to realize that we have this fundamental constitutive lack and we will probably never be loved or known as much as we wish that we were. And on the other side, there's this alienation aspect. We are alienated into our language. We are far more constituted by our experiences, by our language, by our histories. We can never escape our histories. That's generally one thing that lands a lot of people in therapy. Um, and the more that we obediently submit to the superego, it's, it's sort of like that old Stalinist joke, the more you profess your innocence, the more you deserve to be shot. The more you submit to the superego crafted precariously from your gods and your demons and your books and your parents and your friends, the more you are under its judgment. Lacan had this, uh, well, I almost interjected with this last night, but the better of it, but well, I'll add it now. Um, he was in a book tour uh, one time and was asked by a uh, good journalist, um, why do you write so incomprehensibly? Like, so you wrote this book in Crete and nobody understands it. And it seems intentional. What's going on? What are you getting out of that? And he said something that I really like that's kind of stuck with me. I actually read this after having read, I think, everything else that Lacan has had published. And I got to the end and read this quote, and it kind of made sense of the whole thing. He said, I don't, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Nobody understands. Um, but I didn't write a creep for it to be understood. I, I wrote it to be read. And those two things aren't remotely the same thing. Um, it's true that people don't understand anything for a while, but the writings do something to them. And I like that idea of reading a book and letting it do something to you. Uh, he also kind of provocatively said that psychoanalysis is not at all in the domain of the coherent. It is a propaganda. And he said, uh, isn't it witty, kind of an asshole sometimes, but, uh, but the basic thing about psychoanalysis is that people finally realize that they've been talking nonsense for their entire lives at full volume. I like that a lot. So um, there's a story that I began this book with um, where Freud and Jung are first coming to America. I think it's in, is it in 1909 that they first came to America? I'm pretty sure it's 1909. Um, they're sailing into New York Harbor, the embryonic field of American psychology and psychiatry, so very curious to hear what this theory of the unconscious is going to um, expose about the depths of the psyche. Um, and Freud and Jung are standing on the deck of the ship Staring at the statue, illuminating the world with some Frenchman's uh, notion of what it means to be free, notion of what it means to be free. And the legend has it, it's not, I'm not sure if actually this is apocryphal or not, but Lacan wrote, the story goes that Freud turned to his disciple and in a moment that could be either immense hubris <coughs> or a very perceptive prescience, because sometimes hubris and prescience are the exact same thing. Um, occasionally, uh, he said, these Americans don't seem to realize that this boat is bringing them the Black Plague. And I really like that. Um, it's not at all clear to me whether or not he was right about that. Um, it certainly was a theory that sort of exposed things about ourselves that we, we didn't have much knowledge of before. Um, whether or not it's really taken, <laughs> Asian America is kind of up for debate. Um, so this whole idea, God is unconscious, uh, that I take the title from, is of course from his famous uh, claim in the 11th seminar, which is where most people start. I actually like the 7th seminar the best, and I'm glad you guys are reading it. That's, that's, that's my personal favorite, but it seems everybody starts with 11, where he says that the true formula for atheism is not God is dead, but God is unconscious. Um, and what he means by that, well, uh, Lacan is clearly an atheist and at the same time seems to jeer every time somebody asks whether or not one should be an atheist. He's actually asked in seminar on anxiety 
um, he's asked this question, should a, a, should a psychoanalyst be an atheist? It, can you really do your job if part of your fundamental way of viewing the world still attaches itself to this manifestation of the big other? And then further, he gets pressed further, someone asks, well, what about, what, okay, just bracket this, the question of the analyst, we can, we say that an analyst's end is really cured of their symptoms if they still believe in God at the end. Is it possible to end psychoanalysis and still be a theist in some sense? And Lacan, kind of in his characteristic way, kind of scoffs at it and says, well, if you're talking about an obsessional that's sitting there asking you whether, like, what if begging you to tell them what they're supposed to do with their life, then I can guarantee you if they haven't been divested of this neurotic structure, in one way or another, they still believe in God. Um, so there's this kind of thing that we do where, um, first of all, in the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, I think it's important to clarify, Lacan, you know, said the gods belong to the field of the real. The big other is in this symbolic realm that creates our lives, and then whatever manifestation you create to attach to the big other is imaginary. Uh, your big other can be your friends or your political ideologies or your gods. Uh, the big other is not God. God is one manifestation of the big other. And in as much as we don't think through how we're retroactively testifying the imaginary tier, uh, the symbolic other, uh, what we're doing is still this sort of rearranging deck chairs. Um, so we can think through if you have this, uh, you know, say somebody comes to analysis and the anal analyst realizes that at some level everything that the analyst is talking about is an attempt to please her father. And living your whole life, getting the right grades, dating the right partners, uh, jobs, you know, success, everything that she does is to try to please these parents. If at one point her parents suddenly die, um, is she free of, of her injunction to obey the parents? Right? Of course not. If anything, uh, the, the death of the father makes the demand to obey all the more pronounced. If you're an analyst and you're sitting across from the analyst's end and you realize that she's doing everything that she does in order to obey a parent who is not a seed, what you don't do is you try to tell the analyst, the analyst's end, hey, your parents are gone. You don't have to do this anymore. Um, because she knows that. Like, that, that's not up for debate. That's not part of the question. Um, the the, the analyst's end knows that the parent is dead in this case. It's the parent that needs to be told that they are dead. So there's this uh, there's this uh, stupid joke that uh, I think it, it's not original to Lacan. It's famous in Lacanian circles. I think because of Zizek, is a stupid, stupid joke that sort of illustrates this point where you know the one where the man thinks that he is a piece of seed on the ground. He's confined to a psychiatric ward, thinking that he's a piece of seed that's going to get stomped on or eaten. After years of work, he's cleared for release because he's come to the realization that he's actually a human being. And on the way out, the, uh, the, the psychiatrist have sort of devised this one last test where they say, if this guy is really cured or not, they place a chicken outside of the ward. The guy goes outside, sees a chicken, runs back inside, and you know, screaming, there's a chicken outside, it's going to eat me. And the psychiatrist says, look, we've been over this a million times. You are a human being. You're not a piece of seed. You're not going to get eaten. And the psychotic says, don't be so stupid, don't insult my intelligence. I know I'm not a piece of seed, but do you think the chicken knows that? Right? And it's a stupid joke, right? I know, it's like such a stupid joke. I, th I think that what we do a lot is though, um, what Khan's claim is, is that we have um, these situations in which we know that the parent is dead. And we know that the uh, lovers that we've had in the past are no longer thinking about us and judging us. We know that the kid that made fun of us on the playground when we were little didn't really mean all that much and doesn't even remember saying that thing that you still remember. Uh, we know that we are not a piece of seed and we know that gods are dead, but does the big other know? So um, one thing I talk about a little bit uh, is the, the whole question of uh, what religion is in the first place and what psychoanalysis has to say, uh, not about theology per se, but just the general manifestation of this human need to be religious. You know, the vast majority of people on the planet believe in one God or another. 
we seem to have always done that. I was most of the way through for it sort of even um, my master's in theology, before it even sort of really occurred to me to ask how long has our species been religious? Like, when does religion start? It's not an immediately intuitive question, I suppose. Um, we know roughly the ages of our Qurans and our Bibles and our Vedas, um, but that only goes back so far. We have an 11th but when do we actually start to become religious? And the question becomes more and more unclear the further you go back, because really all that you can gather evidence of before writing is um, what survives, um, you know, which what, what can be fossilized, right? So what we find is, uh, what we look for, what ants look for, is death rituals. Um, so uh, we start you know, uh, going back uh, 30, 50, sometimes in the 300,000 year range, we find uh, mass graves, we find people, uh, tribes that buried with their tools. Uh, Homo sapiens, I guess, is a point of reference to mention that is a little under 200,000 year old. Um, we find Krug magnons, Neanderthals, even Homo erectus, uh, burying each other with tools. Some people think this is maybe a primitive afterlife. Um, the very existence of mass graves connection with death and a ritual that would happen with that. Sometimes we find uh, tools that we think are, are reminiscent of what a shaman might use. There was even a tribe um, about 900,000 years ago that would, when somebody would die, they would deflesh the skull with these flint knives and then paint them with a red clay pigment and arrange them in a cave. And I think it's interesting because it's hard to read too much into what this actually says about religion. It certainly says something about it certainly says something about anxiety. One of the things that Lacan says is that you know, he develops a, fear, a series of, of triads. Wherever you find one of these things, you'll find the other two. One of them is that wherever you find anxiety, you will find inhibition on one hand and symptoms on the other. Wherever you find a symptom, you will find anxiety. Wherever you find anxiety, you will find inhibition. And so part of what we do when we're looking at what religion is, is we're looking at a series of symptoms per se, but we're looking at manifestations of anxiety, which are in turn manifestations of inhibition. So why inhibition? So why do we become religious? Well, first off, it's important to realize that it seems that our oldest evidences of ritualistic behavior uh, not only precede our evidences of gods, but also precede evidences of sapiens. It seems that actually um, species that predate our own by sometimes hundreds of thousands sort of this emotional connection towards death and the early shamans gathered their tribes around them and enacted the magic ritual Lacan of course says what's interesting about the shaman is not what he's doing again what's important is not understanding what's important is that something works um, so the shaman gathers his tribe around him enacts the magic ritual um, Religion seems to only have really two sorts of meaning, sort of this, uh, this sort of the, you know, psychoanalysis really all comes down to alienation and separation. Uh, religion really comes down to personal meaning and tribal cohesion. Uh, you know, personal meaning, uh, you know, members of my tribe died. We need to make sense of that. We need to feel better about that. Um, you know, why does the moon move the way it does? Oh, moon got it. There you go. Um, so we have this element of personal meaning, and then this element of tribal cohesion, the uh, way to deal with trauma. The other was proto-politics. Um, this is sort of one of the reasons that the politics and religion don't seem to be that easily separable. As um, in many ways, they are. I don't mean this metaphorically. I mean in a very literal sense. Uh, they are different ways of talking about uh, many of the same things. They're very different languages. And the question, you know, Lacan engages about like what is a shaman doing? is that it's very interesting that whatever he's doing seems to work even though it's, it's a complete farce. The shaman is always oscillating between the roles of priest and politician, prophet and charlatan. Uh, Lacan, of course, gets called the charlatan himself pretty regularly. So, um, let's see. Um, so from there, um, let's move into um, one of the things that I'm doing, so my book is, is seven chapters that sort of tries to introduce someone who wants to uh, you know, become more familiar with sort of the religious themes uh, specifically. Again, I'm not trained as a, as a clinical psychoanalyst. I'm uh, trained as a philosopher and theologian. And so my goal is to give you some of the basics of his theory in the first two and three chapters. 
and then sort of developed uh, what neurosis and perversion and psychosis is. And then after that, I get into the political dynamics that uh, critical theory has picked up and made so popular. And for psychoanalysis, or you know, we see these in religious behavior too. Um, not that I think that we need to distinguish between the two. So I have two chapters, uh, you know, fifth and sixth chapter, are on Lacan's idea of the fool and the knave, and then the four discourses, which I think is uh, the four discourses in particular, something that I want to develop more in my dissertation. I think it's, it's a very interesting way of thinking through political theory. Lacan, of course, early on was very, very adamant that we can't use psychoanalysis to talk about politics. Um, he was very, very clear. He was very terrified that it would become something that would just become sort of this proto-religious, very vague uh, thing that could, you know, would just, you know, elude any sort of measure of exactitude. Uh, but he also said that uh, on the matter of exactitude, orthodoxy is what one holds to when you have nothing valuable to say about the doctrine itself. And so sometimes these ideas and, and push them a little further. And so in the seventh seminar, I don't know if you guys read this piece, but it has a section on the fool and the native that I think is very interesting. So um, since developing uh, neurosis, perversion, and psychosis has, has been done to some degree and is probably a little difficult for me to explain right now, let's talk about uh, this role of the, the, the left-wing fool and the right-wing name. Um, this is a thing that I think is very interesting because you see it not only in politics, you see it in religion. Every time that someone lies to you, and it's clearly a lie, uh, you have ultimately, you, can, you know that either they are a fool who believes themselves, or they're a cynic that just doesn't care and is using the lie for something else. Lacan, you know, so I said inhibition, anxiety, inhibition, anxiety, symptom. Another triad that Lacan develops is uh, lie, ambiguity, mistake. When you see an analyst then start to lie, you're also going to see this sort of ambiguity. I don't really know what I meant. And then mistakes, slips, you know, I, I swear I didn't mean what I just said. Uh, you're going to find these. And so Lacan says, you know, what's very interesting about sort of left-wing politics is sort of always has this position of hysterically poking the master. Um, and he doesn't mean fool in the sense of, of stupid. He means this sort of um, almost childlike faith that things can and will get better. So the, the left-winger is always poking at the master, saying, you know, things that you don't actually have to wonder, like, why they believe what the things that they believe. They're usually genuinely good causes. You know, you don't have to look at a left-wing uh, figure and say, like, what's what's the real motive between, one, like, the, you seem to want everyone to have health care or equal rights. You, like, it doesn't take, like, a lot to sort of sort through uh, why people sort of want sort of just genuinely directly good causes that um, nevertheless, there's uh, you know, what Lacan calls it chimney sweeping uh, treatments that, uh, that, the, that the left will deploy, um, and liberals too. Um, this is not, it's not just something that just explicitly de like develops on the left. Um, so Lacan says, you know, the analyzan will come into therapy, analysis, um, comes in, and there's 10 stories that we could talk about a week. One of those stories is the one having that story or if your unconscious is censoring that story and doesn't want you to talk about it, what you're gonna do is you're either going to talk about the, all the other nine stories, or you're gonna include that 10th story, but you're going to couch it in all the others and try to misdirect the analyst. Um, if the analyst is not trained very well, then the analyst gets misdirected. This is sort of what Lacan says sort of happens on the left too. Um, you know, so the left wing politician will say, you know, here's a million big posits, here's, you know, Rights for minorities, healthcare, uh, minimum wage, all these things. Um, I, you know, I really hope that you don't ask me about the, the campaign finance issue. So that's sort of this misdirection. The right winger, on the other hand, like Khan says, is very different because as a right winger, you know, you see today, you know, these right wing politicians will get up and they'll say, um, you know, I don't know that the president is a Muslim from Kenya. But he might be, and there's also Benghazi. So it's like, just vote for me, you know. So, so the concept is like, it's very interesting because you'll get these right wingers that you can share at the hotel bar after the crowds are gone, and you know, you can just say like, I'm very concerned about some of the things you just said. Uh, do you really think that like the downfall of the U.S. is going to be this, you know, whatever? Um, Lacan says, you know, like when you when you talk to to, to these these sorts of politicians, it's kind of basic structure where they'll say. Don't insult my intelligence. Of course, I don't actually. I'm an educated 
number of society. I mean, this is what I'm paid to do. Um, so he, you know, and then he develops this thing where he says, you know, groups of fools sort of desire a leader who will lie to them. Um, if you genuinely want to believe in the direct sense, if you don't want to think about the big other, if you don't want to think about all the signifiers who have, that have told you what to be in your world, um, then what you're going to end up doing is you're going to, to pay a leader who will lie to you. And a liar is a, is a cynic, is a knave. Um, and he doesn't ever explicitly state the converse, but I think we kind of see it too. Like, if you're the type of person who wants to be very, you know, cynical or educated or skeptical or whatever, um, you nevertheless desire the kind of leader that can occupy this position that you can't occupy of this sort of. I think we see this very much in, I mean, I, I don't want to go too much into, into the sort of how this works in American religion, but, you know, just a, you know, a, a brief, uh, you know, one example that I use sometimes is surveys consistently tell us that um, between 45 and 48 percent of American Christians believe that the world will end uh, by 2050, uh, which creates enormous problems to construct energy policy, um, right, or, or warfare. When you're talking about uh, at least a third of your population doesn't believe that the world's going to be around in three decades, then you have a serious problem. Um, and what you sort of get is these communities who will have sorts of beliefs like that that are just very, very obviously counterfactual, just very delusional. You have this desire to, uh, you know, end the world and take ourselves with it. Um, we'll have no problem sort of finding this sort of leader um, who is willing to occupy this cynical position of, you know, just tell the crowds what they want to do. So, um, so I developed that, I developed the, the four discourses, the university master hysteric and analyst um, and I conclude with this kind of question that I kind of leave open of you know, the final chapter is called the prophet and the charlatan if you sort of recall what I was saying about the the um, shaman is always oscillating between the role of priest and politician prophet and charlatan Lacan is very regularly called a charlatan I'm not ideas have shaped me and been very, very personally meaningful as well as theoretically helpful. Um, but I do think that there's this interesting point where, um, you know, he's uh, asked a question, what I alluded to, this sort of interview in the beginning um, that's found in the Triumph of Religion where this this poor journalist is is as asking him what, what you're doing. And, he, you know, he starts off and he's saying, okay, look, on, uh, you are, you know, incomprehensible. What's, what's, the deal with this, you know, are you a philosopher? And Lacan says, I'm not a philosopher, not in the slightest. Uh, and he says, well, um, what's your distinct message? What, what, how are you different than Freud? And Lacan says, I've never pretended to invent anything at all. I've never done anything new. And then the, you know, the guy says, well, why write it you know, incomprehensibly? And you know, Lacan says, well, you know, again, like I said, um, People don't understand anything for a while, but the writings do something to them. And then the journalist says, well, what happens if people leave because you're incomprehensible? And Lacan says, I'm happy when people leave. It's way easier when people leave and stop bothering you with questions. And then he asks this one question uh, that's, that's very famous. It's, very, it's the title of the book. Uh, the, uh, the, the guy asks, so what of this battle between psychoanalysis and religion? Because there is a battle. You're calling each other a farce. Only one of you can win this battle in the end. So who's it going to be? And Lacan famously says, uh, "There's no more joking at this point." You know, he's, he says, uh, "Religion is is going to win. Uh, religion, above all, the true religion, is powerful in ways that we cannot begin to comprehend. It has so many." ways that it can repress and return to repress and disavow. It has so many creative defense mechanisms. It has so many ways to deal with anxiety and inhibition and symptom. Uh, religion will win. And I think that's kind of an interesting place to leave it, uh, because Lacan clearly doesn't think that religion should win. It's not even clear that he actually even meant <coughs> that statement in the first place. But there's sort of this aspect to um, theory, I think, generally, is that you always kind of have to occupy really clear if you know um, quite what you're talking about, but occasionally, uh, occasionally, um, you know, uh, immense hubris and immense oppressions can coincide. Um, in the end, we're marked, you're thrown into this world that we mark with signifiers, and those signifiers mark us right back. Belief gets into us, it doesn't seem to lead us very well. Um, you know, so Freud brings a plague. Um, it seems that we've been religious since before we were homo sapiens. And if 
Lacanus, right? We'll just keep being religious until we are extinct. Thank you. So questions, comments, pushback, resistance. I have a question about uh, the, so like, like evangelicals in America who towards the end of 2050, say, or before then, or by then. Um, kind of going back to what you start, started off with, talking about belief and talking about the big other, whether you believe in God or not. There's this idea, I'm not too familiar with it, but I know there's this idea of the subject supposed to believe or whatever. Like, like in Lacan, I think my question is, do those people like do they do they really believe that? I guess is my is my question. Like, do people who think the world's gonna end today, do they directly like actually believe that? Because I I have friends who who tell me that they're like I, I just don't understand why you like to study religion. I just think it's dumb. Like, it's stupid that people believe these things. I'm like, well, yeah, I agree, but I also don't really think that they really believe it. Like, really, but I yeah. don't want to. It's hard for me to can't speak to someone else's experience necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I think I that we kind of got on the same topic last night where we kind of said, you know, like, well, what, you know, what do you desire? And you know, the joke is that you, know, you can't know what you desire. Um, and belief has that same function. Um, you know, I might go to the voting booth and, and vote for a candidate really well if the world does in fact end by 2050. Um, but everything about, you know, me having like a retirement plan suggests that I don't actually think that. Uh, everything about me, like, you know, hoping I can have grandkids one day or whatever, you know, clearly shows that like, there's there's all sorts of elements in my life that don't believe that. And that sort of gets back to why um, psychoanalysis is so helpful to religion, because, um, you know, as much as we um, would like to be cured of this need for a big other, um, you get rid of one manifestation of the big other. You knock away that one belief. and you know, the person suddenly becomes a little more progressive and you knock away that suddenly the person becomes an atheist and attaches to a new ideology. You know, like there's sort of, there's always this kind of rearranging, but I'd, I'd agree very much that like, it, I don't think that, that, that to say, what do you believe is so unhelpful uh, so much of the time because what you believe is, you're just talking about the, the imaginary tier at that point. You're not talking about the symbolic and you're close to touching the, the real which is where Lacan likes to say that's the real is where the gods really are. It's where the trauma is. Everything else is just retroactive. I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. Um, after hearing you for 45 minutes, because um, um, I'm, I'm, I've been reading Lacan for me is extremely difficult and I'm, I, you seem to be talking about it with such ease um, and such mastery. I don't know where else. I, I have. I don't know. I'm just. I'm speechless at this that's, point. That's very kind. I, but I, I have. I um, would be less. I would. I would be more. <laughs> I don't know. So, I, uh, I and yeah. I. I Arlecchini in a room might, might disagree. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, well, <laughs> I, I said genius or else. No, no. I don't know. Um, I, I have one question, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you've answered, but um, it, everything went so fast. The answer. Um, what do you think about theology and psychoanalysis? And my question, I think I'm going to go back to what um, Matthias mentioned. You know, if poetry and psychoanalysis have, are friends, mm -hmm. then what would you say religion and psychoanalysis are? That's interesting because I wouldn't say that they're the same thing. Uh, I would say they're mortal enemy. I, I sort of frame it as, I don't know if this is sufficient to answer that, but I want to sort of frame them as two um, fictions. Um, I like to think of psychoanalysis as a very healthy fiction. I like to think of religion as a generally negative fiction. Um, with positive elements that we're just not going to get away from. Um, and I mean fiction, and I question a lot from people who know that I'm into psychoanalysis, and I'll have friends that will come up to me and say, like, I'm just about convinced that there's an unconscious. I, I'm not completely convinced, but, like, I'm getting there, I think, because I kind of see, like, how I might have, like, these subliminal things and these synapses that I'm not aware of. And then I always want to say, no, like, you know, you need to understand that, like, Lacan was emphatic about this. The unconscious does not exist. It is not a thing. It is not what people usually 
um, by the, the subconscious you know, connections that you don't, you're not aware of. It's, it's not something that exists at all. It is a schema that insists. It is a way of talking about behavioral repetition. Um, so I use it in that like fiction sense of like, um, I think theology is helpful, um, regardless of like bracketing the question of whether or not there is such a thing as God. Um, I'm what, skeptical, you, what, what do you mean by theology here? Well, yeah, and that's probably um, because you know, that's I question. guess like for, for people who don't do theology a, 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 a whole lot, um, there's theistic theology and then there's this sort of more materialistic theology that sort of descends from uh, you know, sort of Hegelian and Marxian traditions. Um, I like to, um, so, so to me it, there's well, I particularly like this uh, comment of um, you know, Carl Schmitt, the, the German Jew in sort of the 40s, um, developed this idea of political theologies where he says, you know, um, he uses the term theology, what does it mean? Well, think about it like this. Everything in our world today uh, that we call political theory is really just secularized theological concepts. We used to call um, God's sovereign, now we call the nation state sovereign. We used to say that God's could proclaim the exception. Now we say the executive branch is wonderful ability to pardon and to say that, you know, uh, children needed to be sacrificed and now we fetishize, you know, uh, our college students and turn them into fetishes for like student loans and you know, does need to be sacrificed or whatever. You know, he says kind of everything today is theological except, and then I, I love this comment, he says um, everything's theology that we're seeing today, um, except for whatever the theologians talk about. That's the only thing that's not theology. Um, and I love that getting at, um, there's this very boring theology that, that talks about God as if there is a God, or as if like whatever truth claims are, are absolute and are, are things that you actually live as if you believe in, in the first place, which is fictional, it's ridiculous. Um, but to see these sort of, um, you know, the fetish of commodities, um, the sort of absolute trust that we have in completely unconscious systems that we have no concept of whatsoever, is sort of through sort of political theologies and economic theologies, um, even thinking of philosophy as a as a type of theology without revelation, but, you know. but so but that's very, it, it's very big. I don't think that there's like a really good definition that, that can bind them all. No, no, there shouldn't be a definition. Um, but you know, and in, in my problem historically with quote theology is the kind of the you know. Maybe not self-conscious enough about what it's really talking about. And one thing that's really struck me in your, you know, your particular take on what's going on in Alkani and with religion, and I, I kind of like that, is you know, the whole thing about anxiety, which has been a theme in a lot of our discussions. You know, we all we all move, we we speak out of this realm of anxiety. You know, we uh, it's this it's this. Anxiety that some somehow tries to achieve a certain a certain kind of voice, and it may be as a philosopher like Luce says, a stuttering voice, or it may be, you know, we, we learn to speak authentically. That's of course Heidegger, but could it could it be, you know, that both psychoanalysis and religion? I don't say theology. But could it be that both psychoanalysis and religion are uh, the performativity of anxiety? Uh, and in, in many respects, the logical enterprise is the effort to foreclose that anxiety. I mean, I, I think that there are so many in his confessional forms, for sure. In confessional yeah. forms, Which but you know, even in said. its liberal forms today, yeah. or even its evangelical forms. I mean, you know, I've I've heard so many of these discussions before on both sides. You know, I mean, liberation theology. You know, what you know, humanistic theology and so forth. There's also theism and so forth, and arguments and debates and so forth. And my question is, you know, she had, you know, can't we can't we move this conversation to the couch? Uh, you know, in, in, in some ways, it's like, it needs to move to the couch. I mean, in some ways, I think Lacan is the one who can get us to see that. You can't do a Lacanian 
theology, and we're going to do a Heideggerian theology or a Zizekian theology and so forth. I mean, this is one of the big problems I have with Zizek. It's one of the big problems I have with the way people have read my own works over the years. It's, it's like, okay, well, here's, here's the kind of formula I've got. You know, it is sort of, there's a little bit of anxiety and it's a problematic, but sort of everybody's moving in this direction, talking about this. And now, you know, I've got a new way of talking and, you know, I was talking about, um, you know, you know, every, everything is language and now everything is object. You know, and back forth. And so maybe next week everything is object. Well, I mean, basically what that, what that is, that's a resistance. To coming to terms with this this performativity of anxiety that I'm, I'm talking about. But I think Lacan, I mean, Lacan is obscure over the last night, and you know, he's deliberately obscure. Uh, and uh, he's uh, he's meant to be obscure, and that's because but you can't you can't have clarity and anxiety at the same time. Okay? Well, I think in a way you can. Um, I mean, well, we kind of have to say about it than I did last night because of later developments. Um, but um, if you think about anxiety, so one of the things that I say in the book, and I don't mean this to sound like a supersessionism, um, but it, there's a sense in which Judaism concretized the symbolic um, through making the law the, the primary order of the world. Um, still, it's an imaginary manifestation. So concretized law, whereas Christianity concretized anxiety. We are always anxious, uh, especially like in its, in its uh, reformation form, um, where there is no more barrier to your zone. So you don't need to confess. You're already accepted. You're already <coughs> damned. You're already someone else's fossil fuel. That's it. Like, you're just accepted. Um, but I think that um, for, Lacan, for Lacan, at least in a tenth seminar, when you feel anxiety, it's because you already know that there are um, and I think that a lot of theology is exactly that. It's like it's concretizing anxiety because, you know, we say, again, we may know that the gods are dead, um, but the God forbid, I don't want to know that. So it's going to concretize this very strict theology to keep me from whatever might actually make me a healthier person. I don't know. Is that a, that might be a terrible way of sitting it. I was, sort of. was going to say something that now I must say, I'm being kind of safe, but it's thinking about the Jew. So you just mentioned the Jewish alignment a lot. Sure. I have to say, um, when you tell the story about Freud saying that on the boat, all I heard in the story was the arrival of the Jew. And so what's interesting to me is that in the history of things, the Jew is aligned with law. It was actually interesting. And I'm thinking of Rosa's side, but I think this is broader of other theorists, which is that in the unfolding of the Christian story of the Jew and the law, what the Jew actually symbolizes is the rupture. <coughs> because living as a Jew is an experienced rupture that the primary one primary identity that you have in conversation with theology and otherwise is that they are not part of that entire discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and so the sort of um, anti-Semitic symbol of the wandering Jew and the unheimlich is actually now in the space here, the opening to that flower. So I, I just wanted to put that out there that we need to problematize the role of what the Jew symbolizes. Because I think in certain Christian stories, the Jew symbolizes the law. And the Jewish experience of living as a <coughs> in the Christian story, the Jewish experience theologically is one of the rupture. And in the anti-Semitic story of the Jew as the modern Jew, there is that an anxious Christian awareness that the Jew represents the rupture and the poetic. There's no Christianity, there's no totalizing of Christianity as long as the Jew keeps sitting there. So in the, in, from the lecture from before, the place that that flower grows I mean, in a way, just to speak of the Jewish experience within the, the Christian story of what the Jew is, it actually feels more like the rupture. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think say I say that out loud because partially also, in one way, when I theorize, and I look forward to reading this, I, I, I just, of course, I look forward to this. Um, and, and again, I see that in the description that this is 
against implications of Christianity. So that's not a, a critique. But part of me wonders if this is the story of the Christian God is Jewish. Me, another subtitle for the book. And I don't know yet what I mean by that, but that was immediately what I read the title of in the space of the conversation. So I just want people who are thinking about and this is part of my, my, you know, when I hear people talking about differences in theology and things and bad things universalizing and Paul and Luther, and it's like, hey, there's Jews and there's Muslims and there's Hindus. So what does it mean? Let me let me say what I mean here by the Jew is the non-Christian. What does it mean for the non-Christian to be in the space of wrestling with the positive or negative aspects of Luther and Paul and um, the spirit? It's, it's an interesting thing to just for, to worry about. I don't know yet what to say, but... Yeah. I look forward to thinking about what I want to well, say. Well, thank you, and I thank you for that. I don't think that I could put it any better. Like that, that's fantastic. Thank you, and and you're and you're right. No, the book is admittedly completely deficient in in terms of other theologies aside from <coughs> Christianity, and and part of that is just I'm admittedly writing from both my training and my upbringing. Um, and I I try to make I joked about it with Tim uh, when he was you know announcing, but like this is this is really book really was me. Lacan is very interesting theoretically, but uh, reading this material is very, very personal. It's, this book is very much me rethinking some things about myself during a, a very difficult time that I was writing in. Um, so it's very much out of my experience, and there is so much more that I'm not even remotely qualified to talk on with the sort of thing that you're talking about. So thank you for that. Time for one more quick, very quick question, if anybody has one. I'm curious about this barrier of Jewish love. Okay. What is it that you mean by this? Uh, Khan sort of puts it on the side of, I wish I had the, the schema in front of me. Um, I can't remember particularly which one. Was. I'd have to look it up. I'd have to look it up. Um, yeah, it, I, unfortunately, I don't have anxiety with me. Um, I don't have the book. <laughs> I have a lot of anxiety with me. Um, no, but he does describe it as this this sort of, there's this um, removal of a barrier that's access to Jewish um, When we start to feel that that barrier is, it doesn't need to be there, we try to shove it back into place. And, oh, there we go. I'll, I can look it up now. I can cross through it and then check it later. Excellent. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and then he has this whole, this element where he says, um, you know, you don't get, um, Anxiety because you doubt. Anxiety is the cause of doubt. It's like when anytime you're doubting something, it's because you already feel this moment of anxiety, which is this already this moment of feeling that there isn't this this barrier to what needs to happen. Um, I think it's a weird way to phrase anxiety. I'm not completely on board with that because the way that I think the anxiety in general um, is a little bit different than what Lacan describes. But there is enough in there that I'm, you know, I'm just going to defer to the master. Um, at least as I understood him, but you know, maybe we can uh, look at this and uh, see if there's if there's more there that I should explore. No, right. I'm interested. Just I, I just thought it was a very fascinating. Seminar. You can ask the last question because you're you're cutting into your own time. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to cut into your time. <laughs> but, uh, so the last question is you you're uh, you're relating. Again, I said yesterday I'm very much in this so I'm trying to. says that guilt is the only feeling that would arise one once that you have given up on other side. So I'm wondering if you uh, if there is something of this that you see in in the relationship that you put forth in the book or probably in your own experience as you just have not in um, I don't have anything directly on that the way that you're framing it, but I do reference that um, I forget which essay it is of Freud's, um, where he has this very, it might be just the one on, on obsessional action and religious behavior, but I can't remember for sure, where he uh, makes this like 
um, this is very true of me, um, where he says, most people, when you give them the choice between anxiety and guilt, will choose guilt every time. Um, because that, like when you're guilt, you can pin something down, you, can, you kind of know your circumstances, whereas anxiety feels sort of free-floating. Lacan says, you know, anxiety is not fear without object, but it's fear located in the real. Like, so it's, it's, it's a very, this very unstable condition. Um, and so most people would prefer to feel guilty and condemned and adopt that superego and live under its judgment um, than, than to feel this sort of free-floating anxiety. So um, I think that that's a little bit different than what you're very interested to know more about that. Um, but. Excuse me, what, this, this is great, but we really we need to move on. It's <laughs> okay. So. Yeah. We're moving on. Oh, we are. Okay. Right. We also need to take a break. So. Okay. Go ahead. Three, three more minutes, okay? I hope perhaps this that I'm saying is understood by everyone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
bridge, 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 yes, bridges. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay